Global Forum, uh, organized by Office of Global Affairs in collaboration with the Multilingual Intercultural Center. Global Forum at Stony Brook University is designed to foster a dialogue to engage the campus community to talk about issues that are relevant to all of us, faculty, staff, and students. We have done a number of topics over the last two years, such as global engineering, global medicine, study abroad, international student success, multicultural, uh, culturalism, and intercultural communication. But that some topics deserve multiple times for discussion. So today we are going to discuss another relevant topic, which is most important to all of us here. That is multiculturalism and student success. We are very honored to be able to invite a distinguished scholar and a researcher, Lourdes Ortegas from Georgetown University. Before I introduce her, let us first extend our welcome. <clears throat> I have known Lourdes for more than a decade. She is a known figure in the field of language education, multiculturalism, and intercultural communication. She was a recipient of the Pinsler and TESO Research Awards in 2000, a doctoral Mellow Fellow, a postdoctoral Spencer National Academy of Education Fellow in 2003. Actually, all three of us Professor Agnes He and me, all three of us, and the Lotus received this award. So we have something in common, that is award from Spencer and National Academy of Education. As young scholars, we were identified to tackle some thorny issues in the world around language education. So that's why it brought us together to, for this uh, particular forum. But Lotus is also a senior research fellow at the Freisberg Institute of Advanced Studies in 2010, and very currently, he, she is distinguished ARC, means Advanced Research Collaborative Visiting Fellow at CUNY Graduate Center. Unfortunately, not SUNY, but CUNY is very close to us in Manhattan, the City University of New York uh, system. She is past editor, one of the top journals in the field called Language Learning from 2010 and 2015, and she serves on the editorial boards of many key journals in applied linguistics. Professor Ortega investigates second language acquisition and focuses on the instructed development of bi or multilingual competencies in adult classroom settings. She has long-standing interests in the study of bilingualism across a lifespan usage-based linguistics second language writing, systematic research synthesis, and epistemology and ethics in applied linguistics. Professor Ortegas was born and raised and a college educated, not in the United States, but in Southern Spain. He spent a year abroad at the University of Munich in early 1980s and worked as a teacher of Spanish for almost a decade in Greece, obtained her doctorate in the United States, the country where she has lived and worked for the last 25 years. She is multilingual, Spanish, German, Greek, English, you name it. So she is most competent and uh, credible in talking about the issue because she has done all kinds of research within the field and she traveled around the world as invited speakers. So I'm particularly delighted to have her here with us. So let's. It's a custom for us to invite and welcome our outside speakers. But also, we have very distinguished professor here within Stony Brook University. So next to her is someone you know very well, Dr. Agnes He. She is professor of ling applied linguistics, founder and a director of the Center for Multilingual and Intercultural Communication. She is also currently chair of the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Stony Brook University. She received her education in China, Singapore, and the United States. 
Her research focuses on language use and language development in multilingual contexts. She attributes much of her professional and personal growth to the complex and colorful multilingual worlds in which she has lived. Among all her publications and among all her distinguished awards, I want to mention two. In addition to a Spencer Award, she is also a Guggenheim Fellow, which is a prestigious recognition in the field of social sciences, humanities, and language. So she is one of the few that received this uh, award. She is also uh, received a, a National Science Foundation a million dollar grant to look at an international TAs teaching in the United States through the Michael uh, multilingual lens. So I would say that uh, uh, both of them are extraordinary and outstanding. So I'd like you to reach out to your hands to do one more time. And I will introduce myself very briefly because it's unfair to give equal weight. And I am Jun Liu. I'm Vice Provost for Global Affairs and a Dean of International Academic Programs and a Professor of Linguistics. I've been in this field for more than two decades and I'm honored to be here to lead the global initiatives at Stony Brook University. I did not ask for it, but you, you did it, so I want to say a few more words. <laughs> At Stony Brook University, we care about the success of students, either international students or domestic students, because we believe that the success of a university relies on the multicultural, uh, multilingual backgrounds of the students. So we not only nurture our own students to study abroad, but also try our best to recruit the most talented international students to this community. But what is more important is to create an ESO, an environment for them to interact through various programs and various events. So I hope that with our effort, all of you, each of you will feel that Stony Brook University is doing something which will benefit you not only now, but also in the future. Last week, we talked about diversity and inclusion. All of our faculty and our staff received three hour long training. In the essence of this training is the foster a culture that celebrates diversity and inclusion. All of you are here from different cultural linguistic backgrounds, but we want to make sure each of you feel that we extend the greatest support to you when you need. And through participating in this kind of forum, I'm sure you are going to be empowered to understand where in the world this research is going on and how we can take advantage of the new concepts, new ways of thinking to empower our daily life, either as a student or future researcher or a multinational uh, company employees in the future. So without further ado, I'd like to throw some questions to our panelists, including myself. Then I will leave sufficient time for all of you to ask questions. Those who will speak first usually will receive awards, gifts, but the gifts is within your imagination <laughs> because that is the boost of your own confidence. We have microphones on both sides, so I will devote the first 30 to 40 minutes to Q&A within the panelists, and then I will throw questions to you. If you want to take notes and formulate your questions, please feel to do so because I believe, and all of us believe, that truly uh, the meaning comes from, through interaction. Since the topic is multiculturalism and student success, so I want you to understand what it means by multiculturalism. So that is the first question I want to give to our uh, distinguished panelists, Lourdes and then Agnes. So what is culturalism? What does it mean in university settings? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah? Okay. So what is multiculturalism? Hmm. Multiculturalism usually is defined in any university setting as um, students who bring to higher education a background where more than one culture is or has been present. Oftentimes, it's equated with not being the mainstream, right? 
So mainstream students and multicultural students. But I think that that's a, a false opposite because many mainstream students do have a lot of experiences of different cultures, both in their backgrounds, in their family backgrounds, in their neighborhood backgrounds, uh, in their school backgrounds during high school, but then when they come to university. So sometimes we tend to um, create those two extremes, mainstream versus multicultural, but we should be looking at the multiculturalism in each of us, regardless of the official notion of multiculturalism as non-mainstream. Mainstream people can be very multicultural too. Very good. So Agnes, can you share your perspective? Uh, I will just add to what Lourdes has already said. I, I think multiculturalism, multilingualism is not just a, a state of affair. It's not the condition in which we find ourselves, but it is also a disposition, it's an attitude. It is a, it is a stance that we take. Do we allow ourselves diversification, you know, diversity, uh, not only finding diversity and appreciating the, the diversity in the people with whom we interact, but also do we desire um, diversity in our own thinking patterns, in our own thoughts, in our own lifestyles. So I think that's that's another level of understanding of multiculturalism. And I think that is particularly important for college campuses because this is where students you are spending, I'm speaking as an older person, I didn't mean to sound patronizing, but this is the time <clears throat> of your life where this is the formative years of your life, right? And this is the time that's crucially important for us to be open to differences, both within and beyond ourselves. Absolutely, I agree, both of you. And as an administrator for uh, the university, I actually deal with the multiculturalism all, all the time, you know, uh, encouraging our students to study abroad to experience different culture, inviting international students to come to this campus regardless of their linguistic cultural background, they feel welcome, feel respect, even though some of them might not speak good English, but as they are still respected, not because you cannot speak the language as well, but because you haven't had opportunities to practice that language regardless. So I would say that it is particularly important to raise the level of multiculturalism in the diverse context of diversity of the cult of the university. So I tend to argue when we talk about diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, internationalism, all these are very important uh, to, uh, to, to be ex in existence on university campus. So if we, we seem to agree on this broader definition in different phases, but next question I want to ask you is that what are some of the opportunities brought about by multiculturalism for all students, either international students or domestic students. Agnes, you first. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be fair, right? Opportunities, all right. Um, when we talk about opportunities, there are real opportunities and there are used, I want to make a, dis a distinction between used opportunities versus um, potential opportunities. Right. We, if you if you look at our campus, if you think about the things that you have to do, from getting breakfast to going to bed at the end of the day, right? You know, how many of you can go through your day without talking to someone who either comes from a different background or who speaks a language, who has the capacity to speak a language uh, in addition to English? Raise your hand. Can you go through a day? Uh, what, what, what was my question? <laughs> Can you go through a day without being without being engaged, without talking to someone who does not come from somewhere else, or who does not speak a language that is uh, in addition to English? Is it a problem? Can you do that? I, I don't see any hands anymore. All right, sorry, I didn't get it right the first time. I'm using English as my second language, by the way, so forgive me. 
All right, so, so, there, so there is diversity exists, that is a matter of fact, but that does not mean that we are engaged, we are leveraging that diversity for our purposes to enhance our learning and the life experiences. So, so I think we need to sort of differentiate that opportunity that we're talking about. There are ample, limitless potential opportunities, but perhaps we're not maximizing the benefits of those opportunities. I'll, I'll stop here. Very good. Lourdes, what do you think? Yeah, for your question, I immediately thought of a metaphor that a, a feminist writer uh, from Argentina, Maria Lugones, has offered us that is called, uh, the metaphor is world traveling. And what she means by that is to learn to see ourselves through the eyes of others. So to learn how others see us, who we are to others. So it's not the typical metaphor, learn to look at the world and see the world through other people's eyes, put yourself in other people's shoes, but it's more like see yourself, understand how others see yourself and then see yourself in a new light. And so we travel worlds when we are able to see ourselves through the eyes of the other, right? And what a, what a better opportunity to do that in a university where you are side to side, studying, living, sharing new knowledge, new exciting learning with people who are different from you, right? We don't need to travel, do tourism, go outside the country or anything like that. We can also do it daily if we pay attention to how other people are not just looking at the world and understand, oh, they look the, at the world differently, but also they are seeing me with different eyes and I am this some, someone different through their eyes. Once we understand a few of um, ourselves through the eyes of a few others who are coming from other backgrounds, we have such much richer idea of who we are and who we want to be and who we can be for different people, because that's also important to have the flexibility to be different people for others so that we can interact with others and learn and help others learn as well. So that's probably at the, higher, at the level of higher education, one of the ideals to learn a lot from other people who come from other backgrounds, who have other life experiences, but also to help them learn too. Right? And in the end, learn so much more about ourselves through the eyes of many diverse others. Fabulous. Uh, I, I certainly can link whatever uh, what you talked about in terms of the empathy, willingness to listen, and try to understand in others' perspective or through mm -hmm. others' lens. And I can remind, uh, I'm reminded by lots of our own students at Stony Brook University. Once they have opportunities, to travel to Korea, to Vietnam, to Europe, for a few weeks on study abroad programs. When they return, they suddenly seem to have transformed their perspectives. Mm -hmm. So there are the people who are willing to help international students. If they have any difficulties, they know that they've been there, they struggled you know, in the different context. So that certainly creates some kind of uh, broader perspective of respect, acceptance, and also willingness to help. But certainly these opportunities are not taken advantage of by all the people. And there are some challenges in getting them there. So I also want to ask you, apart from opportunities, what are some of the challenges that are brought about by bilingualism for all students, domestic or international? So, so Lourdes, you already touched upon this. Can you elaborate a little bit on the challenge side? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the challenges are gonna be different if you are new to the system of higher education, new to the university system, and you're also new to everything else. So the country is new, the language is relatively unfamiliar, even though anyone who comes to study in the United States already has a lot of English. And, and if you're one of them, you should be very proud of it. But everything is new, the environment, the city, the people, the food, the weather, 
uh, the TV, uh, and what it, what it means to be a good student, right? What it means to be appreciated by your professors and by your classmates. So there's a lot of learning that uh, has to happen very fast. And some people come from other countries and other cultures better prepared because of a number of reasons as well. So the degree of familiarity and newness can be different for different people. And it is a challenge to feel like you're so new and so different from everyone else, supposedly. I remember when I was a new student, I was an international student, as I'm sure we all, all, we all three share that. Yes. So I remember when I, start, when I arrived in the United States in 93 as a, as a new graduate student. And um, I mean, I, I was in the United States for, a, for, a, for graduate studies because I had a lot of faith in myself and I knew that I could do it, right? And I had very strong goals. And yet it was so scary to look around in a small class, like a seminar style, you know, 10 people talking to the professor. And my peers, they seemed to be so confident, so well prepared, they were so eloquent. And it wasn't just the English, it was also that they had gone through a, a, an education system in high school where they had practiced public, public speech all the time. They were raised to doing that. And I was raised writing a lot, but saying very little. So there, there are a number of learning, um, learning areas and socialization areas that have to come, and we have to be very good and patient with ourselves and learn to take risks, but they have to be calculated risks. And we need the help of professors who are looking at us and seeing more than just the slightly incompetent newbie person that we tend to be in the beginning, and also peers who also see us and see us for more than what we can do at the at that moment but then the other challenge is the opposite if you are very very used to your own environment and there's a little bit of discomfort becoming a new student in graduate school or undergraduate school you have a lot to learn but there's a lot that is already familiar and expected and so it's easier to not complicate your life and to concentrate on your own needs your own routine your own life and not to pay attention too much around you, right? Um, so then the challenge is not to miss those learning opportunities. Difference means learning. And we learn the most through negotiating, understanding, and embracing difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. So you touched about a number of pertinent challenges. Uh, Agnes, do you have anything to add or dif differ? Um, I would say that any kind of diversity, including language diversity, can be a, a double-edged sword. And I, this is a tricky statement to make, but I want to make it, right? I think right now, I think most people would agree that diversity enhances creativity. I mean, there are all kinds of social, political, moral reasons why we need diversity, but in terms of learning, I mean, here, this is a learning environment we care about was the best for learning to take place. I mean, there's a lot of work that shows that the more diverse people you work with, the more creative you become. I mean, that's, you have divergent thinking, you have different sources of ideas. So, um, you know, how do we get creative ideas? We, a creativity meaning, creativity actually means you get two otherwise unrelated ideas put together and then something new happens. That's creativity, right, connecting the dots. So that's why actually we listen to music, we take a walk, we get people to have coffee, tea together just so that we can get ourselves stimulated. And sometimes we travel. But the beautiful thing about working in the diverse environment is that you don't have to travel to Spain, Germany, or wherever, and then you have people who are right here who are different. I think that is okay, I think people got that. But the problem is that diversity could also be very messy. Linguistic diversity is also very messy. I'll give you an example. I've talked to undergrad, both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, most of them work in science and engineering field. They would tell me, I would absolutely just talk to students from China because it's the, the problem the, the problem says, it's, we do it so much faster. You get what I'm talking about? Doing a problem set, it's so much easier and faster because we're using the language that we share. If we include other people, it's going to take a lot longer to get the problem solved to get the work done. There's a lot of reality in it. I mean, it may not be the story we like to hear, but that is what actually happens. So I think any kind of diversity, linguistic diversity included, 
requires good management, and this is something that we haven't talked enough on this campus, at least, to the best of my knowledge, right? Celebrating diversity is enough, is not enough, but we need to know how to manage that diversity so that in the implementation of our tasks, in the carrying out of our activities, how can we make that diversity actually promote and enhance our goals so that we can be more productive, successful learners and scholars? That is something that we have to do. How do we do that? So that's the challenge part. Because we are different, it requires more negotiation, as the Lord just was talking about. It, it requires a give and take, the negotiation. That is work, that is time, right? But it is, it, it's a process that we need to go through to appreciate the value of negotiation. Somehow, after we negotiate, after the give and take, we become better thinkers, we become better speakers, we become better writers, we become better scientists, and so forth, right? But that is a process that has to take place, even though it takes time, it's some, in many cases, it will take extra work. So it is the challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Right on. I think you've alluded to a deeper level of diversity and multiculturalism. We all celebrate diversity, but if we celebrate diversity without inclusion, it means nothing. And we've recruited all the students from multi multilingual or multicultural background. What are we going to do to help them succeed? This to me is, is really the key issue that all university faculty, advisors, administrators, and mentors and domestic students need to think about to help. So I want to slightly shift our topic into the management facilitation of multiculturalism and diversity. So all of us have worked in university settings. Lotus worked in at least four universities. Uh, I've known Lotus uh, when both, both of us were in Arizona. She was in Arizona Northern you know, Arizona University. I was at U of A. Then she went to Georgia, Georgia State University. And when I took a position in Georgia State, she left for Hawaii. So I cannot follow her that much. And then, then when I came to Stony Brook, she was already in Georgetown, in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And Agnes also traveled around. So we've been in a different campus environment atmosphere. But one thing for sure that we've observed, participated, and advocating an issue, how are we going to help facilitate diversity and multiculturalism. So do you have any uh, advice to share? Well, uh, all the universities that I've worked at have a number of uh, services. Um, they offer usually support for writing through a writing center. Mm -hmm. And then the trick is to actually have enough tutors and people who understand writing well enough to support uh, writers who are multilingual writers writer in, uh, writing in English. Um, um, uh, the Office of Global Affairs mm -hmm. or International Students, depending on the university, is called different things, but they do a really good job of orienting students in the beginning, and I know those orientations can be excruciatingly long and confusing because we're new and we suddenly are showered <laughs> with so much information, but it's very important that, that uh, the office plans these orientations and tries to do it well. Um, a big part in every university, and I don't know what happens here at uh, Stony Brook, is working with faculty. Mm -hmm. Faculty, professors, uh, instructors, teachers, lecturers. They also vary in their degree of multiculturalism and diversity, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, there is a big difference um, if your professors understand diversity in the ways that we've been talking about, and if they're able to teach in a way that is inclusive and that mm -hmm. is supportive of diverse backgrounds. Yeah? And I don't mean just international backgrounds, I just mean diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. yeah? So very, very <clears throat> easily, um, difference of, of the diversity kind, domestic or international, gets confused with incompetence or with lack of motivation to succeed, mm. right? And so the university needs to be closely training professors across disciplines in these areas. 
Well, I think uh, it is well said. Uh, I also try, you know, tr to encourage the faculty to be more uh, mindful about uh, our students, where they are coming from. But it's not that easy, you know. Sometimes when they are in the classroom facing a group of students from diverse cultures, they are at a loss how to engage them. Many professors came to me and said, hey, I'm in engineering department, I teach a course. Uh, to my surprise, 75% students are from China. And they are so good in the final examination, but they just don't talk in the classroom. What can I do? Then I smile. I say, I know how to do it. But I'm not sharing with you. So I'm going to ask Agnes to talk about her experience because she <laughs> directs the Center for Multilingual Intercultural Communication. So as a faculty, there are certain emphasis, but certain resistance, certain issues with faculty. It's not easy to say, you do it. You cannot do that. So you have to find a way as head of English, uh, head of Department of Asian, Asian American Studies and the director of the center. So what is your advice? Boy. <laughs> I, um, let me preface this by saying uh, what I've just said before, just to reiterate. I think this sort of a linguistic diversity, the existence itself is insufficient, doesn't do much. It is the engagement that makes a difference. We really have to have meaningful engagement so that we can benefit from linguistic diversity, right? Uh, so it, otherwise, it doesn't matter how many languages exist on campus, how many different countries of origin that we have on this campus. That's not going to make us learn better. So I think the key is engagement, mutual engagement through meaningful interaction. Now, what is meaningful interaction, I think, varies from setting to setting, from classroom to classroom, from task to task, from occasion to occasion. So if you would let me, I will end at this uh, here so that maybe we can, when we open up for Q&A, yeah. so we have specific cases, we can I'll be very happy to go on case by case to see how some of the things can be handled in terms of classroom discussion, management of assignments, management of uh, laboratory uh, activities, uh, collaboration, cross-disciplinary work, and how that is possible. But uh, I want to be sure that these are the things that the audience have in their mind. So I want to see, are there any issues or strategies you have to empower international students with academic literacy development, in particular academic writing. I thought we were going to open it up to the audience. Yes, this we can. We, we, we don't have to answer that. <laughs> but I think this is one of the things. I want you to ask similar question as I just did. So this is the example, OK? okay. I'm an international <laughs> student. I feel great, but I, still I need help. I need you. So you have your voices. We have microphones. And uh, who will monitor here? And I want volunteers to make sure. Or oh, you stand in line. I, we want to hear questions. We want, won't over elaborate on our answers. We want to directly answer. And if we are different in answers, we are going to offer you different perspectives. Is that all right with you? All right. Let's stand in lines, please. Who has the microphone? Speaks. Yes, you go. Go to the side. Speaking Pick of meaningful, side, yeah. meaningful engagement. And you can stand in line now. You don't have to speak up. We'll take turns. Identify yourself and ask your question. Good afternoon. Um, first, I need to appreciate what, your, what you just shared about your thoughts. They're inspiring and profound. And uh, I would like to ask uh, something apart from the benefits of the multicultural, multiculturalism. Um, firstly, we know that America is known from, for a immigrant country, but, um, one second. But, um, and uh, I believe that our school and our country have the incentive to welcome all the intelligent people from around the world. But recently I found a trending around the world that we name it Andy, anti-culturalism, anti-globalism. And we can source this from the, like two years ago, we have Brexit and we have Trump being our president and he advocates 
and he advocates for, for some policy that is pretty conservative. He protects some, okay, I'm not gonna talk about that. And uh, even some refugees issue. So I would like to ask that, how will you, some professional, okay, some professor in the multiculturalism field comment on this trend? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we all heard the question, so yes. guess the first. I'll just say we are all very, very worried about this. I completely share the sentiment. My own response has been the research needs to change. Universities are privileged places. We all are getting, receiving, and um, acting upon a very privileged education that not many people have. If you think around the world, we are the elite, the intellectual elites. And so when we resist and when we build education and research around resisting against these world trends, that's the best response we can have besides personal responses and civic responses, obviously. So we share the, the worry, the worry, and um, my main expertise is with research and teaching. I know how to teach very well. I know how to research very well. Can I respond by changing somewhat my research agendas and my ways of teaching to actually counter with daily actions and with the daily products what's happening in the world? And the Brexit and Trump, um, the election results are just two symptoms a lot of the world is going in a very worrisome direction. Ryder? I would say this is all the more reason we need to have an in-depth understanding of multilingualism means and multiculturalism means for us, both as individuals and also as a collective on campuses and elsewhere in other communities so that we can have better equipped uh, more rational, multiculturally, multilingually educated global citizens who can steer the world in the right direction. And uh, as university administrators, we have reassured all our community, especially our students. This is our commitment. And we, regardless of the political situation, that we will do what we can. We might not change you know, at a high level, but we can change what we do on a daily basis. Arranging activities, providing services, running workshops, all foster an atmosphere and a message that we celebrate multiculturalism. We embrace diversity and we focus on inclusion. If students have any issues, any concerns, we have offices, we have a mechanism to listen to you, to help you, to advise you. So I think we will do our best in spite of the current overall political climate. Thank you. You do have a gift, okay? So one day you stop my office, I'll give you something, all right? <laughs> but uh, I want to encourage others, please take advantage. And this is your chance. Thank you. Identify yourself, please. Um, my, well, you can call me Mimi. Mimi? Okay. okay. And my question is, you guys mentioned about inclusivity. Like, we're very diverse, yes, but like, I feel like you guys mentioned like, um, these Chinese students, they only stick to other Chinese students and Indian students stick to other Indian students. So is there any way that we can like improve that on campus? Because I feel like it's still very, uh, like divided and like maybe international students are like scared of talking to like domestic students and I feel like like all the international friends I've made I've always had to like approach them first and you know be all open and stuff and they're like very scared especially to speak English and stuff sometimes so yeah like how can we like improve that more kind of very good very good we have the director of your center to speak up. Yeah. I volunteer to address that question. Thank you for the question. Uh, that's, that's exactly what I had in mind. We need to have it, we take very specific measures to improve engagement you know, beyond coexistence. 
right? So I think part of this is we ha we have to create a common goal and the shared activities that are meaningful for all the parties involved. So what is your learning? What is the context? Are you talking about is it extracurricular life or is it between, is it a classroom activity that you were referring to? Extracurricular. So I'm aware that there are lots of student bodies on campus, right? And then student bodies don't always talk to one another, am I right? Some do, some don't. So uh, at the MIC, the Center for Multilingual Intercultural Communication, we've tried um, a couple of initiatives in the past few years. We tried to bring together uh, different groups to talk about their concerns. A lot of the concerns are shared, right? Uh, it is very interesting. People always say that nobody talks to us. And then everybody says nobody talked to us. And then even at the meeting, <laughs> when you have the, uh, the club president sitting together, they all say the same thing. It's just repeated over and over. So if this is a shared concern, then we can figure out a shared solution, a solution that is, um, that is desirable, that's, that's productive for all. You know, what are some of the extracurricular activities that we're all, we're all interested in? And then what it would be the benefit of working together rather than working separately? I think we need some incentives for doing stuff together, right? I'll give you an example from my life, my professional life. I do research on looking at language, language use, language development, primarily from a social science kind of perspective. But I learned a lot by working with colleagues from other departments because, you know, I may be doing the kind of qualitative work that is generating hypotheses, but they're really actually testing those hypotheses, right? So I get a different level of validity, a different level of uh, 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 corroboration, collaboration from my colleagues. So there are reasons for me to work with people who are different. In this case, it's academically different, intellectually different. But then what are what would be your reasons for you to be working with other student bodies towards a common goal? There's a psychologist whose name I have forgotten, Lord, as you might know, who says that we, when we are faced with differences, we fear. We fear because we fear whatever we do not know, we are afraid of, right? We fear that we may look inferior to other people. We fear that we may look too good to other people. There's always this fear because we don't know this other person. We also fear because we don't know this other person's background. They bring a whole host of knowledge, expertise, um, the cultural and the, and the intellectual, the social background to it. So the psychologist says, ah, I have to do my homework. I'll bring, uh, I promise you, I'll tell you who that person is says the best way for us to people to, for people to get together is to have some design some activities where you remove those kinds of fears so that we focus on what we actually bring to the table and then create a shared common goal when that happens then we remove the inhibitions we remove those the fear of the unknown i don't know if if this is helpful you know in as you as you um, design and deliver act joint activities with other student bodies? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, this is very insightful. I just want to share with you right now at Stonyburg University, we have more than 16 official uh, regional or country specific student associations. They are all organized under the Office of uh, Student Affairs and we might need to do a better job to have an intergroup uh, communication rather than intra-group uh, activities. Secondly, you mentioned that uh, we celebrate diversity. We also focus on inclusion. So inclusion means that you are not only being invited to join an activity, you should also have your self-initiative to make something happen. That means your voices should be heard and you should offer your voices when you are not invited sometimes, right? So both ways you can feel that you are empowered. So I want to encourage all of you, if you feel sometimes you are not included, doesn't matter, you can be there, you can offer your voices. So it's a two-way interaction 
uh, two-way uh, kind of you know uh, initiation. So certainly that will change things eventually. Thank you for the question. I want more. Okay. No, no. <laughs> I completely agree with both sides, so I would prefer to hear more questions or comments. See, always student orator, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Brian. Um, since we were on the topic of student um, associations having to do with ethnic or regional backgrounds, um, my question is, what role do you three believe that people who were born in America and raised in America but are of immigrant descent, whether it be Chinese, Indian, whether they be Hispanic, whatever it may be, what role do you think that they can play in facilitating perhaps like the shift from, say, Chinese culture to American culture or Indian culture to American culture, something like that? Can I answer first? Yes, please. <laughs> so I think that that's the diversity that is most diverse in the sense that you are people who your whole lives have had to negotiate being and not being diverse at the same time. So you're born in this country, you belong to this country, you are this country, and yet daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, in many contexts, you're treated as not this country and not of this country, right? So your entire life, you have been negotiating and making the best out of oppression, discrimination, microaggressions, and knowing that you are and you are not welcome for who you are, right? And so you have so much to offer in terms of sharing your experiences and your learning and being so much more flexible than most of us are who grew up wherever we grew up, surrounded by, by much less difference and dissonance uh, in a more privileged and protected environment where we learned to be diverse, to appreciate diversity, and that we are diverse to others later in life. Like I learned I was diverse in this US context when I was already 31 is when I moved to this, to this country, right? I've moved around and I've actually, yeah, living in Greece, doing other things. I have been diverse in many different ways. But the notion of diversity as an institutional notion that we need to understand, protect, and work towards is very US. So people who are of all kinds of backgrounds, but absolutely US, born, raised, and bred, you have the best diversity to share and to help others uh, negotiate that, learn to negotiate that. We are too focused on just the country or the ethnicity or the one thing. It's, it's a lot of different things that we are in different contexts that creates this diversity. Excellent. Yeah, I would like to um, share with you an anecdote. Uh, I've had a student who, was, uh, who came to this country when, uh, when she was a toddler uh, from China. And uh, so she, she took my uh, course on intercultural communication. And then one day, she was a very good student. And one day she came to me, she said, well, you know, there was too much discussion in class today. I didn't learn much. That's what she told me, mm -hmm. right? So, and I felt, oh, what have I done wrong? You know, I must have really missed something really important. You know, I teach this course, here's a student who's complaining. So, but the first thing is I really appreciated what she told me. She said, well, her parents have always told her that, you know, you should learn in class, you should learn, like you should be a sponge, absorb and listen. And then just, it's the stuff, the notes that you take, the books that you read that matters. When you just go blah, 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 you're not learning. So close your mouth and listen. Listen very, very well. That's how you can learn. This is, I would never forget that interaction in the, during my office hour. So which, that leads me to think that we have very different kinds of cultural conceptualizations regarding what constitutes learning, right? In some cultures, it is, it is the learning of the stuff, the, the content, if you, know the facts, if you 
know, if you can memorize what the professor has said today, then you have learned something. But if you've spent 50 minutes debating ideas, debating, uh, discussing problems to which there are no solutions, you have wasted your time, right? Not realizing the very process of, the very discursive process of, you know, um, of, of presenting a position, of uh, supporting your ideas, of uh, making counter argument, or, or drawing a comparison or analogy, that itself is learning. So, so that goes to, uh, there are two things. One is what is learning, and the other is uh, what is the optimal learning process. And these are real, there are real differences. They are really real differences, deep-rooted cultural differences in terms of those, uh, those conceptualizations. And if we don't understand that as students, you know, our parents may be telling us something, then we may be experiencing something else in the classroom, then there's no congruence. And then you would, one day you feel you've learned a lot, another day you feel you've learned nothing. But as instructors, if we don't understand our students are coming from different uh, uh, or uh, have different ideas about what constitutes optimal learning, then we may be disappointing our students without knowing that we're disappointing them, right? And then we think we're helping them, but we, we may even not be uh, telling them in explicitly enough terms, uh, alternative paths towards uh, learning towards uh, being, a, uh, being a productive and successful student. So I use that anecdote to show that we have a lot of students who are 1.5 second generation uh, immigrants uh, uh, or, or second generation, and then they are really torn. They're torn between different cultural schemas and they are they're socialized through with different uh, ideas about you know, come to reasoning paths, and uh, these things, these things really play a, a big role in their attitudes, and their not only attitudes but also in the actual performance in in the classrooms and in their interactions with other students. Yeah, uh, I agree both of them, but in particular, Lauder's perspective in the diversity within diversity, I think that is very profound. And uh, as a university administrator, again, when we are asked, how many international students do you have? We have to say, do you count by visa type? Or do you count by the length of stay in the United States? Or do you count by self-perceived or their self-oriented uh, 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 identity? So when we say international student, actually there's a wide range of their linguistic ability, language proficiency, cultural or multicultural uh, backgrounds, etc. And some people I know that uh, grew up in a family because their parents are immigrants, right? And depending on their socioeconomic status, if they're not playing the mainstream, their children might grow up in a very complex psychological barrier and have resentment to the parents because parents don't speak English and others might be totally different. So I would say this diversity is truly a very complex issue. We cannot say you are Chinese, you are Indian. And even myself came to the United States at a very later stage when people ask me, are you Chinese, Chinese American, or are you American? By passport, I'm American. By identity, I would say I'm Chinese uh, American. But when you ask myself, who are you? I will still say I'm Chinese. That's my self-perceived identity. So all these kinds of things will complicate the matter, but we are celebrating diversity. Regardless, we are part of this society. We could contribute with the best we can. And we also help change the perception. So that is what I want to leave you with this question. We'd like to hear more questions. Yes. You're a professor, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, <laughs> Professor Zan. I'm a visiting scholar. Yes, all right. Um, from from <laughs> China. Uh -huh. And uh, I find uh, Stony Brook is very 
welcoming multicultural uh, institute. And uh, can we record that sentence? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so All right. Thank you. Very at home. Mm. Um, concerning today's topic, I'd, I'd like to share some. Uh, comments uh, yes. with uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. The first is what, mm, as uh, the professors on the stage mentioned, um, multicultural, uh, multiculturalism, to some extent, is uh, with respect to mainstream. And uh, I think up to now we have been. Uh, this is, uh, of course, um, uh, understandable in practice and uh, also the notion being put forward itself is uh, uh, have is, uh, is theoretically with re regard to mainstream. Up to now, I have the notion that the communication is mainly uh, oriented towards the mainstream. I mean, this kind of communication can also be multi-directional uh, between the different kind of cultures, not only oriented to the mainstream culture. I think this is also important for a harmonious um, um, and, and all win-win situation for all parties. Uh, this is the second point, uh, the first point. The second point is that um, <coughs> to, fa to facilitate um, multicultural communication, it sometimes means cost on the part of the administration investments. For example, we have so many institutions responsible for the for people from different kinds of cultural background. Take another example. Uh, for example, when, when you are in Hong Kong, when they are making announcements on the train, it is uh, multilingual. First in Cantonese, then Putonghua, and then English. This means a lot of cost on the part of the management, and also, for example, on the part of the, the passenger themselves, they have to listen, wait for their turns to, to, to listen to their own language, right? Now, this is a kind of a, a difficult situation in some cases, but also it makes possible for really multicultural communication to occur. Now, this is in my second part. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent. So uh, there are several the points. I'd like to see whether you want to pick one to address, or you know, we can, as among three of us, we can probably uh, respond or, or, or discuss a little bit about the, the very meaningful, you know, implication of the word uh, multiculturalism in different social contexts. Mm -hmm. Lord, oh, no, 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 you, you decided who to have this part. Lourdes wants me to comment on cost. Cost. <laughs> right. Uh, I think financial cost is just one kind of cost. I think language is so interwoven as a part of a person's identity, and we have to think about other costs as well. So if a person's if we think of language as being constitutive of a person's identity, so language sort of uh, is part of what we are, you know, then uh, denying a person's language has a very high human cost, right? So uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Professor Wang was talking about financial cost in that case, right? So I just want to broaden that understanding. I think cost is just not in terms of dollars or MMB or something else, but there's also this other dimension of cost and that can be much more enduring and impactful. So I personally do not think that uh, the use or non-use of a language ought to be based or to the decision to use or not use a language, uh, include or not include a particular language, should be based on financial costs alone. So, have I addressed that question? The uh, cost? Yes, partially, yes. You. <laughs> uh, 
I thought that Agnes wanted to answer that question because she is talking about the challenges, the concrete incentives to yeah. make inclusion happen. And so uh -huh. cost is part of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just think financial cost is very important. Time cost is very important. So I totally agree with the example of the three languages, put on Hua, uh, Cantonese, put on Hua, and then English in the okay. metro and the subway. Um, I travel a lot and on the plane, sometimes it, depending on the airline and the destination, I have to wait three or four languages for really long announcements, right? The explaining what's going to happen or, and sometimes I, the linguist poly, polyglot, get impatient and I, I'm like, okay, I understood you already in two languages, just save me the other two. Right? So time and financial cost are very important. However, think of education. If we have the money for education, we and our parents will just spend whatever money is needed for a good education. We want the best education and we'll pay for it if we have it, right? So I think it should be the same for countries, for regions, for institutions. Inclusion is a human right, but it's also a human need to live in peace, to live in, in relative harmonious um, uh, happiness, right? So we have to be willing to put money where we think peace and happiness and well-being is. And certainly inclusion is the only way we are going to succeed in this world that we have because the world is full of inequities and full of difference. If we don't put money into multiculturalism and diversity and inclusion, we are doomed in the long term. So it costs money, but we should put it into it. I believe uh, the cost is addressed, you know, from a different <laughs> perspective. But the other thing has not been addressed, which I want to talk a little bit about, is uh, what you mean by the, the context. In U.S., we talk about multiculturalism. We're actually looking at the minority or people from other countries. That's not the majority. We are centered in U.S., talking about inclusion of all other perspectives here. And that reminds of our terminology, internationalism. Means we have a nation in the center, others around it, international. But if we change another word, buzzword to global, there is no center. It's moving around. A, a U.S. or a, a initiated conference if it's taken place in China, in India, in Spain, its position, its gravity is shifted. But because of the location, certainly I, I, I would say there is nothing wrong. It is so good for us to include that. But multiculturalism in different countries might still have different implications, right? So I, I won't give you a perfect answer, but at least we appreciate your raising this issue to keep us thinking what it, exactly it means. For instance, you know, we are all in the language profession, right? We talk about English is owned by, is it owned by US, UK, Australia, English speaking countries, linguistic imperialism, you know, and those kind of things. Now we're talking about the world Englishes. We have varieties of English which are celebrated in, the, in our communication. So I won't over elaborate. I think ideological concept of shifting of thinking that will strengthen our sense of diversity according to a different social, economic, and, and in, uh, the, uh, the political context. We have time for one more question. Okay, you are the second, you are too late. So she is the best one. So you can ask questions afterwards. I appreciate that. So you ask the last million dollar question. Hi, I'm an international student from China in Asian American study major. Um, I took, you know, a lot of Asian American study courses are related to contemporary political issues in China and many other Asian countries. And after it's it's very detailed and now i'm confused with my country <laughs> and i don't okay. know what's your question how to deal with it do i 
believe in what I learned here or I do I believe what I learned before? Okay, you are confused. Yeah. Can you help her? <laughs> Confusion is a stage of learning. Wow, yeah. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so you're learning. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. The more we, uh, when we learn the most, we're so confused, so conflicted. So you have to give yourself time to go through the learning. You don't need to rush. You don't need to form an opinion just because other people pressure you to do so. The learning is happening right now. It's growing pains. It's not always pleasant. Inclusion is not always pleasant pleasant and diversity is not always pretty it's not always pretty it causes a lot of tensions in ourselves and in others but you are learning now and the confusion we have to learn to be good to ourselves and patient with ourselves and learn through the confusion wait and stay with the confusion and try to search for some personally meaningful answer in the end probably neither the things we learn in our own country or from our own communities, nor the things that we learn from the new communities we get in touch with, hold the truth. And the truth is not going to stay the same for us throughout our lives and our different uh, identities and times. So um, it's all part of learning. Being confused is not a bad thing. So stay with the suffering because eventually there will be some clarity, I think. Yes. Yeah. I uh, was delighted to hear a question so that I know that my colleagues are doing their work. Right. So thank you for the question. Uh, having said that, I wish to add that being a member of a, being a native member of a particular culture does not necessarily mean that we have the truth, the whole truth, and only the truth about our culture. Uh, from an academic standpoint, we need some analytic distance for us to understand where we come from and who we are, and even the languages. I think, for, I think there are a lot of persons in the audience who speak English the way I do as a second language. And then you, you would appreciate when I say that I have learned so much more about the Chinese language ever since I became fairly proficient in English, right? It is, it takes you, you need to travel very far to be able to see things that you used to take for granted critically and clearly. So if you feel that everything that you have known thus far before you came to Stony Brook has been deconstructed, has been dismantled, has been challenged, that is good. The second part of your question, which version should you believe in? I don't think there's any version. I don't think the question is who to believe in. I think the question is how to find out the truth and how to persistently finding out the truth by yourself, given the circumstances that you have, and create the circumstances to find the truth. And if I think you're learning some of that from your classes, we would have done something. So first, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you to feel confused. <laughs> Many people won't realize that. <laughs> so the discovery of confusion is the first step of success. Imagine yourself going into a classroom, a professor talks about a theory, shares his or her perspective. You go to a different classroom, another professor will do differently, or share a different perspective. That caused confusion. But it's very normal, it's natural. That's why we are not asking Professor Lourdes Ortega to talk on this issue by herself. Agnes shows her support, different perspective. I added my experience to give you different dimensions on a certain issue for you to think about, for you to explore, for you to discover where, what else you need to know in order to really 
have a thorough understanding of this particular issue. That is learning. That is a process of learning. So I hope today's forum will not only give you what we consider as knowledge, concept, perspectives, but also the experience. Acad in academia, we need to provide multiple perspectives. Sometimes we need to argue. We need to show different evidences. But all these are scholarship, are research. That is why you are here at Stony Brook University. We want to thank you again, and we want you to thank our panelists again. All right, so you are the first one who received an award, right? Give, you, you, you listen to me. You are welcome to say something more, but the gift is no longer given to you. <laughs> okay, but I want you to say something, so I don't need to give you a gift. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, yes. Because I was someone else. Okay, I will let you speak too. So if you have to leave, please feel free to leave. But Very good. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate that. And uh, since you stood up, I gave you a chance to. Sorry. Yeah. Please ask your last, last question. Oh, you want to go there? Okay. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> this is great to, he to hear more questions. Uh, I'm uh, an IEC student. I, I was confused about the phenomenon I heard from my roommate. My roommate won't learn how to speak Chinese, so he took a course about uh, teaching Chinese. But he he found in, the, in that course they are almost all Asians, and they speak Chinese very fluent. So I was confused confused about uh, whether the international students, uh, the Chinese student, can take the uh, native uh, language course or the like uh, Chinese, they were born in America or they grow up in America, they can take these uh, courses because I think it, uh, it is harmful uh, for de uh, developing the uh, multi multiculturalism. Okay. Yeah, multiculturalism. Uh, that's all. You have a department chair here. Agnes. All right, uh, thank you for the question. We have, we have instituted two tracks for the Chinese language program and one of our professors sitting in the audience, Professor Li. We have a track for Chinese as a foreign language and we also have a track for Chinese as a heritage language. However, due to limited faculty resources, that track is, these two tracks were merged as, are merged as one in, at the intermediate level. So for 200, 300 level, Chinese language courses, everybody's lumped together. But if you go to the elementary level and more advanced level, they're separate. That answers the question. Very good, satisfactory answer to your question. Last question. So once again, thank you very much okay. for coming and uh, we hope you will see us uh, in the future. Thank you. <laughs>